Hi there, it's Peter here again, the guy who hates tomatoes but loves front-end development. In today's video, I will sit down with Arno Tanielian again, and we will break down one of his past projects, stonewallforever.org. So if you are curious how this project came alive, what was the process, what was it to work on a project like this, keep watching. Sure. Um, so thank you for having me again today. Uh, it's a pleasure. I'm very happy to share with you uh, kind of like some insights about this project. So it's a project that got released about a year ago now, uh, a little bit more. Uh, and we work closely with the LGBTQ Center uh, of New York and Google. Um, so we worked with them for actually about two years because this project was a massive project with a very nice documentary that I encourage you guys to, to check out. Uh, and this project was actually the web version, and uh, there's also an AR application uh, for it. So, and um, we basically teamed up with them and with Google to create those immersive experiences where you can basically explore uh, memories uh, inside what we call the monument, uh, where you can really go from the bottom to the top of that monument, where even users are also encouraged to um also submit their own memories to be added to the monument perfect and we're gonna go into the detail of sorry. how the project works and how it how it looks and and stuff like that i just wanted sort of overview which is perfect we know that stonewall forever is a living monument of a historical moment in 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 new york and in the in in the community and i wanted to focus on on the technicality of the project and of course it's a beautiful yeah. 3d experience and i'll refresh the page just to see the first sort of impression we've got a nice i think there was a video playing when i played it for the first time maybe it remembers that i already is. watched it no there should be there's a, it's actually in the background if you if you look at the if you look at the monument it's actually going up a little bit very slowly and it's a nice loop um, okay. but what we do so that's actually a good a good introduction uh, to this website where we wanted to show things as soon as we can to the user. So what we do is that we load an image first that is static, so we can preload the video in the background. And once the video is here, looping nicely, we can then transition to the video. No, um, so is the is the static yeah. image is the first is it the first frame of the video that shows by default, and then the video yes. starts playing on top of it? Yes, yes, that, that's exactly what it is. Um, we actually work so that that's as you were going to see in the in the in the in the website. This whole monument is a WebGL. Uh, it's a WebGL uh, monument. Uh, so we really worked with developers, but also when we were when we had to create this video, we worked with another studio that actually made it, and we had to coordinate our effort between what's actually rendered in WebGL and how it could look on the video. So there are some differences. Because oh, obviously right, video right, right. That's what I wanted to ask, do. whether this video is somehow made with that 3D model we'll see in a moment, or whether they are two completely different projects made on their own? Te Technically, are different. I mean, it's completely different, but I remember having some meetings with those guys to actually uh, give some of the parameters that the developers use in the WebGL uh, side, uh, so they can start with replicates, but there's also some creative choice to make it look a bit different in the intro. Okay, cool. So we had the intro, we had the static image video playing, starting to play on top of it, and you saying the video is also looping, so it feels like the colors and the particles are coming from that one place, right? Yeah, the, the idea is really to have this like infinite kind of monument going on from the bottom to the top uh, that invites people to actually explore and that you can see from very far. Um, this is why we also have this AR application that technically, if you go on site, so on the Christopher Park in New York, and you use the AR app, it can detect that you are there in the perimeter, and then it will show you the movement directly uh, uh, on site. Nice, nice. So let's let's enter the monument. Let's enter it, and of course, I'll mute the tab just so we don't get any feedback. But while while you entering, there is also video playing, showing a little bit of the background of the monument, why it's there and what is it commemorating. And so I'm going to just play it so people get the feel without the audio. So I I'll, I'll recommend you go and watch the whole thing with the audio as well, just so you get the feel of 
how these particles actually relate to the 3D scenes that we're gonna see in a moment. Okay, so that's how it sort of leads you from the first image, first impression, down to a little bit of talking and documenting what's happening, why this monument exists, and then you end up on this screen where particles are coming from the middle of the screen, and you feel like, wow, what is this? How 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 is this? So let's let's talk us through this. What what's the technology behind it, and how how the particles came came alive? So what you see here is the Christopher Park I just mentioned before, where if you would go in that place in real life and use the AR app, you will see the idea is that you see the same thing. Um, so here we're already in the WebGL environment. Uh, it's a simple, simple, it's a simple 360 uh, of the park that we have uh, shooted with another uh, company. Um, and then the WebGL developer worked to integrate the one version of the monument uh, directly in the, in the 360. Nice. And you can actually turn around 360. Is that is that intentional? So you always just focus sort of on the monument itself? Yes, and also because there's literally nothing interesting behind. Uh, <laughs> so it was a creative choice. I mean, <laughs> you could look on the floor, but you know, at some point it would just be the floor. So we limited it. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. more a creative choice than a technology choice. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I thought so. I was just wondering and trying to ask if you know before before someone asks in the comments, let's let's try to answer all the questions yeah. in the. In and, the and, and actually, I mean, we didn't have time. But we thought about even for the the asset that we use for the three sixty, literally put some black because on, on the image to actually make the image even lighter to 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 download. Um, we didn't have time to do those kind of optimization, but creatively that could lead also to a technological uh, choice okay. that could make also the website better. But anyway, we didn't have time. <laughs> so just to sum it up, it's a simple website which has a 3D scene in the middle and of course little navigation on the left that goes to a different pages, FAQ, About Us, download the app, turn the volume on and off. So simple sort of sliding in menu and there's a watch documentary which opens a model with with a full i think it's 20 minutes video explaining yeah. why this monument exists so again encouraging everyone to go and watch it watch the story behind this monument but let's go again to the technicality so if i if i click on explore monument this is the cool zoom in effect and then we are inside of it and this is very cool. So let's let's firstly, of course, there's so many questions I have, and I'm sure the viewers as well. And you, my question, the first question would be the particles. How how are they created? Is there some system behind it? Where are the data coming from? So let's start with the particle. What what is the system behind the particles themselves? So everything's in WebGL, obviously. Um, working on the particle, like like it was really from scratch. So. We worked with a motion designer who actually pro prototyped kind of like some, even the shape of the monument, trying to explore the, the shape of one particular, how it could look like. Uh, but at the end, it was really a, a process working also with the WebGL uh, developer. Uh, and he actually came up with kind of like, he, he led it a little bit the way on on, on the, the, the monument really, how it looks like, what we can do, because there are all those technical limitations uh, around it. So. Obviously, a lot of work behind it. There's a whole system of um, regeneration of the particles, recycling, uh, to be able to have this sensation. There is a lot of particles as you are getting up in the monument, but it's actually a system where it recycles the particles that you just saw as you are scrolling up and down, going up and down. Um, and then there is some blooming effect uh, around it. Like th there's really like a lot of parameters it could play around. Obviously, there's a color system. So just to step back a little bit, basically the monument is every particle uh, is supposed to be one memory. Obviously not every particle is uh, applicable, otherwise it's gonna be just a lot of data, uh, but every memories are organized in, within collections. So this is also the colors that you see on the monument representing a, a memory that is part of one specific collection that basically take you through the story of, of Stonewall. Okay. Um, so when 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 you look at the particles and they some of them are as you said some of them are clickable or not. So you have some data system behind the monument that takes data and then relates one 
story or feature, whatever that is to a specific particle, right? Yes. Yes. So we have made a custom CMS actually for the center to be able to add those memories, uh, to organize them in the, in the collection, uh, and also to be able to add kind of randomly uh, approved uh, user memories because user can submit their own memories with a photo uh, if they want to. Um, and then they could end up uh, living in the monument. So that, that's kind of also uh, part of the experience is to be able to add your own, your own memory. But what is interesting is how then those data are, are digested to be able to build this monument. And uh, Samsi, the web developer we worked with, uh, actually came up with a very cool custom editor for us to be able to work the path of the camera and then also work on the distribution, the global distribution of the, the particles. So even though we, because the data by nature are dynamic, uh, we don't know in advance how many particles there is. So it's not like we can manually put this particle here or this particle here, and it would be just too much work every time. Uh, the idea was really to work on a system where you can work the distribution along the path uh, for uh, the user to actually uh, see something interesting as they are progressing in the in the monument. So there is a whole of um, of work behind it to to really make this monument looking good, but also making the progression uh, looking good. Yeah, no, it's of course a very unusual sort of way of navigating, scrolling down the page and moving up the the monument. So it's a very unusual way of navigating, and I think you described it clearly at the start just use the mouse wheel to scroll up or down or use the keyboard up and down or left and right so very sort of even though it's very strange and sort of very unusual navigation if you have a clear indications and keyboard navigation uh, keyboard shortcuts then it's quite actually easy to use you know what i mean sometimes you can sort of get lost in these 3d spaces and not knowing how to navigate ar apart from just the looking around but i think you did really good job in terms of if it's a different navigation than people used to, show it very clear. And I think there is this uh, information as well. Scroll up and down if you're using mouse or clicking on the glowing pieces. So I, I actually like that you you took the time to actually describe how to navigate it because some, some of the 3D projects, people assume that you know how to navigate it. As you mentioned, that's very unusual navigation. And even for the team, we need to figure out how to take the user in this journey without being too disturbing without be, and being clear. And we had a lot of iteration actually on how to show that on the screen. Um, and, and that's, yes, that's a good point. We, that, that was really also part of the, the one of the core mission for this website is to be accessible because that, that website um, is for the LGBTQ community. And we really wanted to be accessible and inclusive at the core. Um, so, as you are navigating in the website, we really thought about, okay, how to make that clear, how to make um, alternative navigation, way of navigating. So this is what you have at the bottom, uh, all the particles um, by collection as well. Once, when you are clicking on a particle uh, and you are in a particle, you can go from one particle to another. Um, so yeah, that was, that was very important for us to, to be able to have different ways of navigating on the website. Yeah, no, very cool, very sort of, I never feel like I'm, I'm lost. So I know that these are the individual stories inside of a collection one. And of course, there is six collection all together. So feels like even going and there is an animation actually going to this point and zooming slightly in. So I know where I am in sort of the whole monument architecture or, or height of it. And then going to the next one, of course, zooms out and goes to the next piece. So... I feel like that is really well done too in terms of you don't feel lost navigating this massive monument and also then clicking on these collections or chapters, zooms and scrolls to the right place of the monument as well. So very cool, as I said, very very unusual navigation, but very well explained. And because the camera is moving all the way, you never lose the, the track of where you are inside of the monument. Yeah, yeah. And as you're progressing, it's very subtle, but you can see also you're technically still in a 360 if you look at the background. And as you're getting up, the background becomes actually uh, more blurry. So it indicates uh, also that you are actually going up and then you are changing, going from one collection to another. Yeah. 
Now that's very very impressive effect to be able to blur the stuff at the background and as and as you said the higher you are the more blurry things are so you feel you feel higher so maybe maybe it's not a great experience for someone who is scared of heights because you don't know where <laughs> you're standing but <laughs> oh well i think it's very very cool and we said that the the the, the particles that are lighter they are the, the clickable ones so you can differentiate in the color schemes as well what is clickable what is not and just zoom to it so very very perfect perfect way to make the interactivity interesting and you you talked about the the accessibility of course we know that canvas sometimes can be a black box and and it's it's quite hard to navigate so what, what sort of accessibility requirements did you have apart from the keyboard and uh, maybe seo was there anything specific that maybe caused you a headaches while implementing it uh so as i mentioned the navigation at the bottom was a big one uh because as you just said uh, walking in canvas, obviously, make you cannot click, you cannot, I mean, you cannot uh, focus using the keyboard tab on anything on the canvas. So what we did is we need to have this navigation at the bottom for a mouse user, a keyboard user, a voice uh, reader, uh, screen reader uh, user to be able to also access any piece of the website. So that was very important for us uh, to do that. If you were to explore it with your mobile, uh, very common now, but you can use the gyroscope. Obviously, you can tap, uh, and again, use your the, the voice to to be able to to progress uh, in the monument. Uh, as for the accessibility in general, we work with an external vendor at the end uh, to have an audit, an accessible audit on the website, and work with them uh, to try to make it uh, really good in terms of accessibility, making sure that. The image description are, are good, making sure that the ARIA labels are, are valid and, and, and put at the correct place. Um, one little challenge I think I had was the actual navigation to make it fully responsive without having to completely recode something on mobile or on desktop. So that is exactly the same HTML elements and it's just very different CSS uh, that just came. So if you were to resize your, your your window, uh, you will see the navigation changing at the bottom, uh, but that would be uh, that would be exactly the same as uh, HTML. Okay, cool. I didn't actually resize when I was looking at the site before, but I did uh, looked at it on my mobile. And yes, you mentioned that the the way you navigate to it. So you're saying that this this CSS it's just the same HTML elements, but of course, styles are completely exactly. different than on the bigger breakpoint. It's the same HTML element. Uh, but that looks just completely different depending on the breakpoint. Okay, cool. And then, as I said, on the mobile, what happens when you actually take the take take the app or the phone and and move around? You actually that's how you looking through the three D space as well, which I think is very cool. So, did that happen automatically, or did you have to do some other uh, extra coding to make that make that the listening to the movement of the phone? No, you need to do some extra coding as well, and then. But the WebGL developer took care of it, but it's pretty much listening to the correct uh, listeners and then binding it to the to the camera. Uh, but it added a very nice way of like uh, you look around, but you don't feel completely lost, right? It's not like you can completely look uh, uh, around as as uh, like at the beginning. You have some limitation when you're using your phone, uh, so you don't have, you cannot go completely crazy and be lost. Uh, it's very much oriented to. The camera is always a little bit oriented to the elements that are actually interactive. Nice, nice, nice. Look, I've got plenty of questions, so let's get to this. Will be like the fire, fire questions that uh, <laughs> I want to ask, and of course, you 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 will need to answer them because I'm sure a lot of people will will ask me the same. How many how many people were in, involved in the project, and what were what were the the main key roles? Oh, a lot. I would say so. Just for this website, uh, as I mentioned, there's also a backend part of it. So we uh, build the custom CMS uh, using uh, Python on GCP, um, and it was actually a very nice way of having a staging environment. And we have also custom build process to be able to statically render the whole uh, website, uh, because even though what you're looking at right now is uh, is just one like the monument is one page, but if you click on a particle, you will see that the URL changes. So if you were to reload, you would go directly to that particle. Uh, and same for the other little uh, pages. So all those pages are statically built, uh, and we have done like very custom 
um, scripts to be able to build the HTML, uh, also using um, something called critical that allows you to um, generate the CSS critical for each of the pages. Uh, so there's this whole part where we worked with a backend developer that was dedicated to it. Um, we also worked with, I think, myself included, we were two front-end developers. Um, uh, and then we had the WebGL developer that really worked exclusively on WebGL, obviously. Uh, and then on the side, as I mentioned, a motion designer dedicated to the, um, the motion part of the monument. Uh, we had uh, two UX designers, we had two designers, uh, and then the whole part regarded for the AR, we had the production, uh, the, the producers, uh, and then everyone included on the client side. So that was quite a quite a team, quite a team. Okay, uh, I can imagine it's yeah. not done by one developer, and I know of course there's no. there's more people behind it. So where when uh, and and I know there is a lot of complexity in the build in the develop side of things so what sort of what was the role of the designer in terms of did, did when you started to code the project was there like initial sketches that you got and then everything else happened in the browser or was it all just let's go to the code and see what looks good and what comes out of it how was the it's not it's not your normal or standard project where you have a sketch designs or figma designs that you can take and implement in webgl so what is the workflow to get to something like this from the initial idea yeah so i mean it was really a team effort right and a lot of iterations so uh work with uh, ux designers with designers and the webgl developer from day one uh from a creative and technical point of view to try to explore what uh, a particle could look like what the monument can look like and with the UX designers, how we can actually explore it, how the navigation will work, uh, and how to organize all, all of this. So I would say there was a bunch of iterations, uh, and this is actually the kind of project I love because you spend a lot of time actually on the on the whiteboard and drawing and then trying, okay, what if we do that this way? What if we do that this way? Uh, we went through, I would say, at least three main design iteration uh, where we literally had it not fully built, but we had it built and then we figured out, okay, it's not clear enough. Uh, people actually don't understand how to use that. Let's redo around. Um, so it was really a team effort. Um, I would say it was an intense, I think two months, six weeks, I think a month and a half, two months of work. Um, and, and that was, uh, the, this is how we, we proceed. Then for the design, I would say it was, it was very, then when it came to designing the pages, it was, standard in a way that we worked with sketch and the designer just like worked all the screens that we needed for the viewports and provided the mobile the tablet the desktop version um but it was constant iteration with uh with actually the, the implementation yeah yeah i can imagine that it's a as i said it's a unusual project and i'm sure it's 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 one of the more creative projects than um, so that's why I was curious yeah. about the, about the the pro, pro process between and the, the collaboration between the different disciplines of, of, the, we, of the team. We we had a kind of like a storyboard where we not we knew we had an intro we needed an intro so part of the creative to exp explain the story to show the monument uh, then we wanted to land at the bottom of the Christopher Park where the monument is also with the AR application so there's also storyboard that we we used at the very beginning to have this kind of like trail and we knew that we would go up uh, as we were progressing in the monument and that we had those secondary pages um, but yeah this is what drove us uh, as we were progressing in the in the build of this website cool and you already mentioned how long did it take or did you say roughly two months i would say so um i would say so uh, there is also big part of prototyping the monument itself. Um, so, I mean, I wrote a little medium article that you guys can check out after where there's a little Vimeo, a little video that shows all the prototypes, some of the prototypes that the WebGL developer went through uh, that were uh, focusing only on the monument um, to be able to show to the client to see, okay, what do you like? Which which shape do you like? How, how can we explore this? Uh, so there was a lot of work uh, around this as well. Yes, perfect. And uh, so that's your answer to this question. <laughs> one, one, one thing that I really like is actually that even when you stop scrolling or looking around, 
it it all moves but it moves in a yes. so soft subtle way that you don't feel that it's annoying and it's actually quite pleasing just to stop and just look at the particles moving I, i know it's strange maybe it's just me but just to look at the screen now and and seeing like you in a space and it moves and and you know some things move slower faster just because how far they are from you visually but uh, as i said this is very well done in terms of i stop scrolling and the thing still moves but in in a very very cool way Ah, no, that's not you. And, and we even had the idea at some point we're going to do a screensaver using that, but it was, it was just too much. We just stopped there. But face uh, no, we, face we, serial, face <laughs> serial, the face, exactly. We'll see later. <laughs> but uh, no, no, we were we actually liked it, and it, it, that that little subtle uh, movement is on purpose, and that's that's also part of the those tiny details that the that the WebGL developer put in. Yeah, cool. The other thing that uh, I don't know was, was this the WebGL developer or front end developer to actually hook the scrolling onto the 3D scene. So, yes, you spoke about how to how the particles are sort of generated in this 3D shape, and then how is it connected to the actual? Uh, I think the navigation also moves, so there must be some event listeners listening when you hit the next collection. So the next uh, next part of the navigation yeah. is highlighted. So how is that all connected to the scrolling? So even more than the scrolling with the whole application, what we did is I was in charge of the front end, uh, basically, and the WebGL developer of the WebGL monument. And we really found a very good way of working, which is he was providing to me an API, right? As he was, as he was working on, on this, he was providing an API that says, okay, if you use go to collection ID, The, 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 the camera will go directly there, um, provide me a scroll wide value using set scroll and then it will scroll, something like that. So he was in charge of actually providing an API and I was literally just using the API as it would be anything else. So that was a very good way for us to work together. Um, and this is how we work. So on the front end side, it's a pure custom JavaScript application didn't want to use anything like React or anything because there's literally no point. It was mostly WebGL. There's some secondary pages or like full HTML, but there was just no point of using a library on top of everything. And because we wanted to fully control what was happening at any time. So we have built kind of like our custom, it's not a framework, but kind of like a boilerplate uh, just to, you know, have a page transition, uh, being able to listen to, to select and listen to some elements Uh, Etc. So we have this custom putting the stuff in place. We have also our custom state management where we used uh, um, Redux, no, not Redux actually, we use a custom state management and immutable uh, JS. So we had a real state management as if you were using Re uh, React. Uh, there were actually where you can trigger action and then we were then calling the, the WebGL API ba based on, on the action that you call. So it was the, the approach was actually um very very good nice 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 and just to wrap it up and i thought we probably should have started with this discussion is what is the web stack behind it so we've already of course uh, mentioned the uh, webgl or 3js so was have you used 3js or was it done purely with webgl just the raw, no, raw api or what was the code <laughs> what was the other frameworks that you've used on this project So that's uh, for the WebGL is 3JS, uh, but the WebGL developer made his actually own fork on the life of the library. So it's a kind of like a custom version of the library uh, that he's the only one to have it. <laughs> so that's that's interesting, um, but it actually makes some things more performant. Uh, so that's why he basically couldn't wait for the official release. He would just code the stuff himself. Um, but anyway, so as I mentioned, it's a full JavaScript uh website completely custom um i think we were using twig to be able to build the html when we needed it uh so the advantage of twig is that it could be used in javascript on the runtime but also on build time uh with not uh also as i said it's a gcp project uh on the staging website kind of thing so we have an admin only on staging so the admin is not publicly accessible um and we have the staging website there with all the build script and then we use firebase uh, when we want to deploy it to host uh, because it was just easy for us once we have our all of our html files static html files 
to not having to deal with, okay, this one change, we have to remove it and put it new. We just use Firebase, just upload, it takes care of the deploying everything on the CDN, uh, refreshing everything. We have, I think, one or two cloud function as well uh, for the user submission. So Firebase honestly worked perfectly for this, for the, the, the public front side, yeah. Great. I think this this uh, covered all my questions and I'm sure the viewers will have plenty of other questions. So maybe leave the questions in the comments. And uh, of course, we plan to do more live deconstructions where you can ask questions on the fly, but because we're trialing the interview system for now. So that's why we're pre-recording this. But as I said, in the future, definitely we are open to get more questions and review other websites as well. So let us know which websites you want us to look at in the next episodes with Arno or with some other guests as well. That was a cool, cool interview with Arno. Again, I like his insights on the project, what it is to work on 3D animations like this. So hopefully you take some insights from this interview as well. And as I mentioned during the interview, if you have any questions related to the project, let me know in the comments and we might follow up in future episodes. And also, if you have other websites that you want us to talk about or review in the future episodes, let me know in the comments. If you're enjoying these videos, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Until next time, happy coding!